Okay, thank you everyone. Nice to be here. I'm glad I don't have to do the jokes this time, so that's great. Now, ignite time, five minutes. Every 15 seconds the slide's going to go past, so we need to move pretty fast, right? But hopefully in that five minutes I can explain exactly what I want to do today. So I am going to talk about application and cloud misconfigurations, but some strategies around what organizations do because of the noise that these application vulnerabilities bring into the secure DevOps. So let's talk, look at the background now. So if we look at it from a perspective of what we're seeing today, most organizations now are well on the way on this journey, but there's a lot of organizations when it comes to secure DevOps that are still in the world of stop gaps before they actually deploy their apps to production. In fact, I work with some of the largest banks that still have that now. But at the same time, most have embraced the modern continuous like AI-enhanced and distributed software development process that allows you to push applications to production as quickly as possible. But today, what we're trying to solve, though, is how do we do it securely? So we know we can do it fast now. Everyone's already implementing some really great strategies around DevOps, but how do we do it from a security perspective? And, and the answer that I'm seeing with most organizations now is they treat security and blocking of builds using policy as code. And there's a good reason for that. If they do it and they commit it into their source code management system, they're going to get collaboration and they're going to get the, all the benefits of being able to un, ensure that manually mistakes don't happen, right? And it actually makes them more secure as a result. So let's talk about application and cloud vulnerabilities because the cloud obviously has, is a different world to applications, but I'm bundling them together and there's a reason for that. SCA, which we know is open source libraries, have vulnerabilities. Code have vulnerabilities. Containers have vulnerabilities. And clouds has what we call misconfigurations, right? So knowing all that, what sort of strategies can we put into a pipeline to be able to determine whether to push an app to production based on how many different vulnerabilities appear across those four scans? So let's take a look at this example. I'm going to introduce something called ConfTest, right? So I'm from Sneak. ConfTest has nothing to do with Sneak at all, but it's a utility that allows you to run tests on well-formed, structured documents, and they don't care what that is. And in this example, it was a Kubernetes deployment YAML file, and we can then run policy as code templates using open policy agent to be able to actually write more intelligent breaking build capabilities, right? So if you look at this example here, um, ConfTest actually supports a variety of different um, input formats. So you've got JSON, you can use Terraform, YAML. In the examples that I'm going to show is JSON because what JSON allows is the ability to run a, a test through whatever AppSec tooling that you have and actually get that output as the driver as to do I want to push this to production based on all the contextual data that I need, not just the CVEs, is there fix available and much more factors, right? So let's have a look at it in an example. So I just want to highlight that even though I'm talking about it from a CI perspective, when it really comes to pushing apps to the cloud, I really want to do some testing in CD as well. In particular, when I want to check what my Kubernetes configuration files look like or what my Terraform files look like. So in this example here, I'm looking at an SCA and container and code scan. I'm using a sneak test, but it really doesn't matter what you use. But by piping it to JSON, I then get a JSON output of all the vulnerabilities from an open source perspective, right? And so I can then write a test that looks something like this. And I'm looking for three specific CVEs, and I only need one of those to break this build and not allow it to go through. So here, I'm using some smarts around looking at that data and deciding whether or not I want a build to pass. And if you see, the data is actually in the JSON output, right? So ConfTest doesn't care what security tool was run. It cares about the data that it can work off, right? And so here you can see whether it's upgradable, whether it's fixable, all that information is there. So if I was to look at a SAS scan, I've never actually talked this fast. This is Ignite for you. I've never done an Ignite talk, but I've worked out you've got to be fast, right? So in this SAS scan here, I'm looking for hard-coded passwords or SQL injections. If you look at that quickly, because it went really fast, I'm actually going on the number here. So I can actually say if I have five hard-coded secrets or um, three SQL injections, then I want to fail the build, right? And it's as simple as running something like this. ConfTest just runs in your pipelines, and it will tell you whether or not you failed. And lastly, if you want to put all this together, you really want to run these OPA policy files. You actually want them in your source code management system. So then you get that collaboration, everyone working off a set of rules, and ensuring that these are tested well in advance. So that's my five minutes. I cannot believe it. <laughs> yep.
Okay, so uh, this is Abhishek, and uh, I'm working as a GitOps product lead at uh, Red Hat. I do a lot of open source, maintaining a couple of projects uh, with Argo, and today I'll be talking about progressive delivery. So, how many of you have deployed applications to Kubernetes? Pretty much everyone, right? And when I talk about deploying applications, this is what you would see. Uh, maybe uh, deploying, a, creating a deployment service and just an ingress, which is pretty cool, easy, right? But when you have to actually get your application onto production, you need a deployment strategy, right? Assume you're working for a banking application where you have deployed your version one of the application and now you want to get the version two updated. Without a deployment strategy, how would you actually know that the application that you have deployed works on the production, right? You might say, Abhishek, I've tested that application on the dev and staging, but is your production environment, are you sure that it's same as your uh, dev or staging, right? So what I would prefer is maybe go with a canary model or blue green model where I would initially roll out the new version of the application to let's say 5% of the customers or 10% of the customers. Now the real problem of doing that is this guy who is sitting here, let's say a DevOps engineer, has to do all of these things, right? Now it's not just about a deployment service and an ingress. It's so much complicated where you have to play with the ingress controller. You might have to create a new version of the deployment service ingress and you tell your ingress controller just to send 10% of the traffic to your new version or let's say 5% of the traffic. Now the real mess is this guy, this poor guy who is sitting here has to wait till the test team or has to wait till the Prometheus metrics shows up that okay, the 10% of the customers are good. So that can be avoided if you use rollouts. So rollouts from Argo is a mechanism where you know that DevOps engineer will be replaced by rollouts and now it's the turn for rollouts to monitor the 10% of the traffic. It can be monitored with Prometheus, it can be monitored with Datadog or it can also be integrated with your test suite. What I would do with rollouts is I would integrate rollouts with the Prometheus metrics I would be watching that 10 for 10 percent of the traffic probably sent to the internal customer and once rollouts understands that the metrics are cool rollouts automatically change the percentage to let's say 15 20 you can configure that in how much time you want to move to production what's more important is it's not just about upgrading automatically but integrating looking at your metrics, looking at the stability of the 10% of the traffic and performing some analysis using the analysis templates inbuilt with the rollouts and that's how rollouts gives you confidence. And it's really easy to get rollouts. Let's say today you are not using rollouts. You can just install it using Helm or an operator that rollouts has. And the second step is to just replace your deployment with Argo rollouts. So Argo rollouts looks pretty much as a deployment. Only thing that you see different is the strategy field that you see here, right? Here you can define the strategy as canary. You can define the strategy as alternate background or you can define any other strategy. The architecture might look complicated in the beginning, but all that you have to do is do the same thing that you are doing without rollouts. Just change the deployment to the rollouts type. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I'll be here. We can discuss. Okay, so if you hang out in the bleeding edge parts of the internet, you're going to find a lot of uh, a bit of a backlash against Agile recently. A lot of people saying, you know, this isn't really what we signed up for. Scrum is a cancer. Well. Do they want to go back to waterfall? I thought we, uh, we moved past that. Well, most of the people don't. Some do, 
Those people typically work in areas where requirements shouldn't change. And they might have a point there, but we're not talking about those people. As a slight side point, a lot of these people complaining, I think, have it pretty good. They probably don't realize that most people are sitting in pretty god-awful environments doing project meetings all day long. But, you know, that's an aside. Let's listen to what they have to say anyway. Now, importantly, they're actually not complaining about Agile. Almost always, they're complaining about Scrum. People very rarely disagree with the Agile manifesto. So what is it about Scrum? Well, Scrum is big business. Some might even say it's got a little bit religious in nature. There's planning poker, there's agile coaches, and if you ever complain, well, whoa, it doesn't work for you, it's because you're doing it wrong. Well, we've been doing this for 20 years now. Scrum is older than 20 years, but officially 20 years. And if we can't get it right by now, maybe there's something to this. Do the critics have a point? What are the arguments? Number one, way too many meetings and ceremonies. If you follow a proper sprint process, it's a proper scrum process, you're probably spending about 20% of a sprint in ceremonies and meetings. The next thing, this is more of a personal thing that really drives me crazy, is it's very inwards looking. How much of the scrum is spent talking to real users, giving real feedback? Probably zero. Stakeholders get really annoyed at the ambiguity. How many times have you been talking to your, uh, your business stakeholder and said, oh, I don't know, it's a scrum, it's agile. And do roadmaps really change every two weeks? Do we really have to sit through prioritization sessions all the time? If that's true, you probably have bigger issues. Story points are confusing. How many new people to Scrum have you spent trying to educate that mandates aren't actually story points, but story points are this, and we're going to use a Fibonacci sequence here, but we're not going to do that. And then once you actually get to the Scrum, you know that they're going to add extra uh, tickets anyway. There's a lot of external dependencies which get pushed from scrum to scrum, from sprint to sprint, which kills your burn down charts. And if you've got rubbish burn down charts, you start just ignoring them completely. It's very hard to unwind that. So what do organizations do? They kind of drift into this Kanban where they can start ignoring ceremonies and no one really cares. Prioritization gets a bit easier. But isn't that kind of missing the point? So how could we do this a little bit differently? Well, I'm proposing what I've called a surge sprint, name not yet uh, to be finalized, but it's basically how do we reduce some of the overhead from Scrum based on new things that we've learned over the last few years. First thing, two weeks is way too short. Almost all of the issues with Scrum come back to the two-week sprint. If you extend it to a six-week sprint, which is what the 37 Signals guy do in the shape-up methodology, a lot of this overhead actually becomes much more tolerable, and it's enough time to achieve something meaningful. Stand-ups are mostly a waste of time. They were invented before we had Slack, before we had instant messaging. You can do almost all of that asynchronously and just meet up a couple of, weeks, a couple of times a week with the product owner, and that's probably enough. Add a formal user feedback session where you sit in silence while a user uses your software and you watch them as an engineer. That is one of the most awful experiences you can ever do. You will find out how your software is actually being used. And we should be much more clear about our definitions of done. Yeah? We kind of ignore that a lot of times. And if we can't articulate it, then do a one-week design sprint first to get a better picture of what it is you're trying to build. CICD didn't exist when we started Scrum. And so the two-week period was really a way of trying to get a lot of deployments. Well, we've got CICD now. We've got feature flags. We should be releasing continuously, not trying to force it into a two-week uh, cadence. And engineers love a bit of freedom. Why is it that we can't prioritize anything? Well, if you've got a clear definition of done and you've got six weeks to do it in, then you can get that freedom back again. Engineers can leave the prioritization as long as the product team sets the vision. What I love about this is nothing I've just said contradicts anything from the Agile Manifesto. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it. And I think that we have learned a lot since Scrum came out. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. My name is Harish. I am here to talk a little bit about AI. I'm sure you have heard of it and the hype around it. So I'm hoping that this will be useful at some point. So I'm suggesting that this, I'm asking the question, is AI the new DevOps? Or as the inside joke earlier was, is, should it become uh, 
Dev AI Sec Ops or Dev Ops AI Sec or whatever it may be, right? So something like that. So the question is, do I care? And why do you have to care about this? Because you guys are the ones who are leading the pack by trying new things, as we heard in the previous speaker. So what does AI offer to DevOps that is not already being done? To do analysis, the amount of data that was shown earlier with the, uh, when you want to have deployment and you want to have 10 seconds or 10 minutes of one particular analysis and another, can AI help you to do those kinds of stuff in a meaningful fashion? So you don't have to worry about someone monitoring it and then looking at logs and so on. So can this help you? So if as AI becomes a tool in the suite of DevOps operations, that changes how you may approach the entire process. And I think that will be a good thing to see happen. Now, what kind of AI are we talking about? It could be Gen AI, but that's a topic for another one. So can AI help DevOps teams with monitoring and incident response? I think, again, going back to the, one of the earlier speakers, there's a large amount of data, we all know that. There's so much flowing through. How do I know what is it that I have to be looking at that I need to assess, I need to analyze and move and act upon? This becomes a lot harder as we move through the amount of data that is being created and we are all aware of it. There's nothing new that I'm telling you here. All I'm asking you is have you considered using AI in the system? Especially when you deploy AI to do analysis, is there a human in the loop or are you forgetting the human in the loop? Don't forget the human in loop. Otherwise, you have a bigger problem to deal with, which is not what you want to be uh, stuck with. So is AI enhancing collaboration and comms within DevOps teams in this instance? This is probably one of those things that we probably have underlooked. Like uh, as was mentioned earlier, things like Slack and all this, this is an excessive amount of information that's flowing up and down. Can I have a summary of all the conversations that happened last night? So uh, can AI help me to do that? So is it possible as in the, the uh, second bullet says, helping teams to work effectively by providing suggestions and recommendations. So if there's a bunch of conversation that happened, you haven't been party to it, can that be summarized and so that you can then probably uh, use that as input for something else. So at the end of the day, these tools need to be reviewed and reassessed every now and then for currency. Otherwise, there may be a mistake that comes in the summary and then you act on that and it becomes an even bigger mistake. So it's, AI is not the solution for everything, but it is a great help. It's a tool moving forward. So does AI require a cultural shift in DevOps? My answer is yes. I think it needs a cultural shift. But in terms of the shift, does it enhance the productivity in the long term? I, I, I posit that it will. Now, how would it be that is really up to us collectively to figure out how to en engage, use, deploy, and understand from it and change accordingly? So this will involve investing in new tools, upskilling team members. That, to me, is the bottom line. The skill sets are critical. If you don't have the skill sets, then you're just trying something and it breaks, and then you blame the wrong tool, the tool for your wrong actions. So ethical consideration. Now, ethics is all about something that we have to be concerned about at all times, especially when you deal with AI, because there's always this issue of data privacy, the issue of bias. How do we ensure that something that responds to your solutions is not biased? It's, there's no uh, data privacy or uh, security issues. Uh, having clear guidelines and policies. I don't know how many of you here have po proper policies from an AI usage, data structures, and so on within your organization. I don't know. These are important things that have to come back up again when you deal with AI. Active and continuous review of tools. Once you deploy a tool, doesn't mean that's the end of it or everything is good. No, you have to review the tools. The tools may itself be a problem. So we need to go back and look at it. So in summary, if you as a, in the DevOps teams do not use these kinds of tools to help you, you're going to be sidelined by other teams that are going to use it or other organizations. Lean forward and learn from it. Because if you don't do that, and I know this is the group that will do it. So I don't have to preach to the, uh, you know, the converted here, but it's a reminder. Do that, experiment it, try it. Above all, have fun. I can be reached at those places. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Stefan. I'm the CTO at Guardrails, where we make uh, security painless for humans by building the first ever AI security engineers. And today, <laughs> how do we get from manual control to self driving, but for security and what this has to do with AI security agents? But first, Let's engage. I want to ask you a few questions, so please, uh, to see why this matters. 
If you write code in your organization that is crucial for your company, please raise your hand here. If you think this code should be secured, keep your hand up. And this is now for everybody, writing code or not. Have you ever dealt with security and found it to be frustrating? Raise your hand or keep it up. Yeah, look around. It's a shared experience for all of us. Thank you. So, it's true. Security is frustrating. And not just for the development teams, but also for the security folks. And so, why is that? It's because, <laughs> it's because um, we actually, um, like, you know, it has always been like this. Security was always frustrating for everybody, but don't worry, there's actually a light at the end of the tunnel. So, security tooling is actually ripe for a disruption. Imagine a world where instead of giving, giving, uh, getting hundreds of vulnerabilities in your inbox that you have to deal with, you just get really accurate vulnerabilities with exact fixes for your code. And so, <laughs> how is this even possible? It's possible because of AI security engineers that can tirelessly do the heavy lifting for you so that you don't have to do anything. It's actually very similar to how the evolution of cars is evolving, from manual driving to getting more and more autonomous and self-driving. And actually, security, we can finally steer, towards, uh, steer away from manual review towards automated AI security uh, defenses and workflows. So just like an uh, autom uh, autonomous car, security is now able to go from the manual efforts very much to automatic defenses. So now I would like to introduce the six levels of application security automation. So now we will see each of these levels and how it actually gets security closer and closer to being fully autonomous and, and automated. So first off, level zero. This is actually where you do the manual review without having any tools in place. That's actually how I started many years ago. It's really fun, but does not scale. Level one. This is actually where you have some tools available. Typically, you take the source code, you run a scan on demand, you export some uh, results into a PDF, you give it to your developers. Sounds familiar? You probably have experienced that. It sucks. Now, level two is actually where we are at right now, state of the art. This is the best in class vulnerability tools out there that actually already are integrated in the, in the pipeline, scan every code change, and make sure that developers get this feedback on an ongoing basis in their workflow. The problem is these tools, even though they've gotten much better, they're not smart. They don't understand the logic of the application and all of these things. So what ends up, what happens is that we as humans have to look at all of the vulnerabilities and manually triage them and actually find fixes for them. It doesn't work. That's where level three comes in. The first, the eye security engineers that actually look at the code, triage it, and find the fixes based on the security at the context of the application. And this is where it's not, uh, where it's in, uh, not confident. It has human in the loop and can escalate to humans with the full context. Level four is actually where the secure AI security engineers get closer and closer to a human and can actually identify logic issues in your application. This is mostly autonomous, but actually you can still steer it towards um, special use cases in your application. And finally, level five, this is where you are essentially at the expert level already, and you can fully autonomously identify and fix vulnerabilities in your entire organization based on the full business context. And this is essentially where we're going. There's still a long road ahead, but level three is underway. And um, we are already working on level three right now, and I would love to show you how this actually looks like and what value this unlocks today. So yeah, I hope this ignited your curiosity. And uh, connect with me on X or go over to Gardner's AI to see a glimpse of the future. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. It's me again. I'm Min. I'm the modern app specialist from F5. I love storytelling. So today, I'm going to share you a story about James, the IT man applications. So every day, she needs to struggle between how does she manage the legacy system together with the modern apps. So it's keep her constantly on her toe. And then she heard about Nginx Plus. The consultant told her that Nginx Plus can help to simplify her workload and enhance security. So it started like just what she needed for, for to, to tackle her IT tasks. But first, what is Nginx? It is actually a lightweight proxy technology that will help you 
to manage. Um, uh, it's like a, an all-in-one tool that can help you to manage different aspects of your DevOps uh, cycle. I'm going to share more later. But then what, what about Nginx Plus? OK, this is a licensed version of Nginx with enhanced ca capability. So how is it so? So Nginx Plus, as an application delivery controller, it can help to direct traffic into your application. And it can help to balance loads across server, serve your web content swiftly, uh, catch the frequently accessed data, and um, that simply manage traffic into your Kubernetes cluster. So um, these things, um, this these things now is um, is one of the things that are on demand. And uh, when it comes to API operations, Nginx Plus is like a Swiss Army tool because it will help you to control all the APIs that coming all the API traffic that coming into your applications. So at the same time, it keeps your API strong with robust security features. And um, it will act as like the gatekeeper for your API. So it controls things like rate limiting, what kind of protocol that's coming uh, so that it keeps your API strong and secure. Um, we also have another aspect, which is add on to everything of internet with the application security. So this one is take care of the, is keep your overall application strong and healthy. And then it helps you to protect the application against the evolving threat cyber attacks like bot protection at um, DDoS protection. Um, so this thing, this app protect, it can help you when it comes to DevOps, when people care about the API security, then you can think of the op open API spec enforcement. It's one of the things that app protect can help you. Um, so does this solution have an uh, interface? Yes, we have the Internet Instant Manager. This Instant ma Manager can help you to manage all the Internet instances. You, you can see how the instances are performing, what's the health of it, and it's also analyzed the performance so that it can give you suggestions of how can you improve the performance of your Internet instances. Last but not least, we have this feature. It's called Universal Application Server. So this thing is provide a runtime for different kind of languages and services. So we support like Python, PHP, uh, Node.js, Go, Perl, Ruby, and the new kit in town, WebAssembly, Wasm. Uh, so what, what else special thing uh, about this thing is, is, uh, is a fully dynamic application server. So meaning you can change the configurations by sending a JSON REST API. So it can help to, uh, it can help you to have uh, this application uh, re without a reload, as in the, the uh, configuration will be in place. So this is the full pictures of our Nginx Plus uh, features, and I know it's very confusing, so that's why I have this slide to decipher the concept for you. So you can put Nginx Plus as here, as the load balancer for CDN, or you can put it as a uh, API gateway over here to direct traffic to go into your, uh, your application behind. Yep. So uh, this Internet App Protect is actually the Internet security that I was talking about. So it has the same flexible deployment principle that apply to Nginx. Wherever you deploy Nginx, you can deploy Nginx App Protect. Yep. Um, and uh, this thing we have Nginx Ingress Controller. So if you're using Kubernetes, you sure know about the Ingress Controller. So um, are you aware that uh, Nginx Ingress Controller are actually more superior than the daisy Kubernetes uh, Ingress Controller? But I wouldn't be able to tell you within 15 seconds, so check out the FI book behind. Yeah. So, um, so now back to our IP manager, Jean. She loves Nginx now because it's, it's like an all-in-one solution to her. And um, what about you? Um, the, check out uh, nginx.com for more information and trial. Thank you.